Tenhu Zun. Hello and welcome back to our next edition of Our People Speak. We're here at the Morris Thompson Center. We're honored to be sitting here with Jerry Isaac, who drove in from Tana Cross. And this series is hosted in partnership with Tanakanaga, Tana Chiefs Conference, with support from Doyon. Tonight we're going to be discussing rites of passage and some ceremonies and beliefs from this part of the world that Jerry has to share tonight. And we're so honored and want you to feel welcome, Mr. Isaac. Thank you for taking the time to be here with us. It's uh, very meaningful and important, I think, to create space to share and build understanding around things especially that we want our young people to keep in mind. So I'd welcome you to introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Dewey. Uh, my name is Jerry Isaac. I'm from Tanacross um, in the Upper Tanana, right around near Toke, uh, Alaska. I'm, I'm just happy to be here to um, share with you some of the um, knowledge that was shared with me as I was growing up. So if I tend to say things in a, in a way that it offends people, uh, I have to, you know, apologize now because uh, I was raised to really believe in what is right, what is wrong. Um, everything is separated in in st stark reality versus the way some people would want to have things the way they see it. But, uh, you know, life, life is a very direct and a very purposeful situation. And you're, as a person, have to uh, accept your um, limitations. And life is good. It's just you have to make it work for you. Is there a sense of where you're coming from? What does it mean to have a, a marking of someone's life, like an important event? Or what would be something that, that you've experienced or might like to share with our audience around things from your culture that could be um, somehow in the life of a, a young boy or turning into a man or things that you were taught. Is there anything you'd like to share? Well, yes. Um, when, when I was growing up, I was encouraged to harvest game. I was, you know, I was instructed that harvesting game is sustenance and that it was a necessary act that is uh, the responsibility of the young man. And so I remember that when I was a young man, I, uh, I was like seven or eight years old and dip net was, you know, it's like five feet in diameter, six feet in diameter. I had to pull that up and I caught like six or seven whitefish in there. And, uh, Boy, I was proud of myself because I caught, you know, fish. Well, uh, to my surprise, my grandmother cut it up and prepared it for um, consumption. And she took $20 and a brand new knife and had me deliver that fresh fish and those gifts to a grandma from the absent clan. And I had to give it to her. And grandma, old grandma, she, she was so thankful for the fish. And um, she congratulated me and in a native way, just hugging me and encouraging me to be the best man I could be. Um, my first catch, 
I had to give it away to a, an absent clan that um, instilled in me the importance of harvesting as well as sharing mm -hmm. and being happy to share rather than, you know, how sometimes, uh, you know, in our way, I mean, in our lives, there's something that we treasure so much and we don't want to give it away, but there are times in our life that that which you treasure a great deal, you have to give it away. And part of that is, is to, uh, part of the reason for that is to, um, to respect and honor the goodness of sharing. So. Wow, I'm sure as a, as a young person that must have left quite an impression. And I love to see that type of activity or acknowledgement being modeled for our young people. There's examples I've seen and heard from across Alaska as well with uh, first catch or first hunt and I've, I've, I've felt that before with uh, when you give of yourself and, and how that can in our way make you feel just so good. Uh, I want that for more people. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, there's another time when I was about 12 years old I I downed my first moose. It was a springtime, and uh, and there again, I was really happy. I was proud. I got a moose. It was a yearling. Uh, mm, but then I, <laughs> I found out that they butchered the moose. They helped me, my dad and my uncle, and and then we brought it back to the river and we loaded it up on the boat. And then we brought it back, and not one piece of the moose was given to me. It was, we used wheelbarrows at that time, you know, to deliver uh, stuff from the boat to the houses. And they delivered it to one of the opposite clan grandmothers. And uh, in our language, they call it uh, which means a, I don't know how to really, explain the, it's not just the act of giving, but it was like the spiritual honor of giving. Mm -hmm. And when you do the spiritual honor of giving, you learn to appreciate the gift of giving. That's pretty much, you know, what I was told, I was taught that mm -hmm. at an early age. Especially after all that hard work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're sitting there. I mean, um, you know, you, you ask your parents why, and, you know, they'd sit there and tell you that by doing that, um, the Great Spirit will uh, give you more mm -hmm. as you need it. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's where giving, you know, giving, you, you, you just want to give because um, you'll get the spiritual blessing for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you're helping people who no longer hunt or gather for themselves, mm -hmm. you're creating that connection, hopefully for you know, the lifetime that you know that our loved ones are here. And mm -hmm. yeah, wonderful. Uh, would you mind sharing a little bit, you, you mentioned a term in your language. Could you maybe describe for our audience a little bit about uh, how we could build understanding about the clan structure? You mentioned that there's opposite. Is it um, through the, the matriarchs? You mentioned grandmothers. Mm -hmm. Would you paint a little bit of a picture for us so we can start to learn about that too yes um, you know in the in Alaska in our area your yours and mine we have different uh, s somewhat uh, varied um, 
ways of uh, relationship and clanship and stuff. In the upper Tanana, there are seven different sub-clans, but there's two, um, there's two separate groups. One has um, three uh, clans in them, and then the other has four. My uh, clan belongs to the group that has the four clan in it. And our whole relationship with each other, uh, with each other, and with our the absent clan, uh, you know, our, um, our, you know, since you're born, you're born into your mother's clan. Like uh, I am Tikagyu, and my father was Atsidente. Is part of the Nalzin part, you know, and each um, clan they have different responsibilities and different, um, you know, different uh, things about them, and you know, like they're known to have certain spirits, um, for example. Like my dad's family, um, the Alcidente, they're, they're the ones that uh, rightfully wear a uh, marten skin cap. And my clan um, really can't wear it unless it's, it's a gift given to them from that clan. Mm -hmm. um, since you were born, you're on your mom's clan. Your mom's clan was determined by her mother, and on and on. And then, uh, and then uh, you're intermarrying with these two groups of people, not intermarry with your group. Like in my group, there's uh, there's Dikagyu, Chachelyu, Tsesyu, and Chads. Down river, down this way, Chads are what they call Tantiz Az, Tantiz Al Tseel, the middle of the river mm -hmm. kind of tribe, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, these these four tribes on my side can't cannot intermarry. They have to marry on the other side of the group, uh, the Nal Tseen Al Tseedente people. Um, that's how they, um, there's a, a lot of reasons for that. One is uh, in the old days, they used to have uh, successful hunt, hunters, successful trappers, successful fish, uh, fishers, um, craftsmen. Um, it goes all the way down into the best medicine men, you know. So it's uh, the marriage is um, is governed by um, not only you having your clan membership in a certain clan. You have to develop character, and um, your d character development starts from the time you're born. Earlier, I talked about how. Um, you know, if they wished the the baby boy to be a good sheep hunter, um, part of the ritual was that they'd take the little boy's sock or moccasins and bury it on a sheep trail on the mountains. That way, um, their spirit is permeated by the sheep spirit, where it's agile and it's sure-footed. They even climb on the cliffs, mm -hmm. and um, they're not afraid of height. So that's why they 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 do that. They, they associate the sheep spirit uh, with the young man, so that he grows up to 
have the qualities that I just mentioned, being, you know, being sure-footed, not afraid of heights, and, and things like that. And um, it doesn't only stop there. Um, there's a lot of behavioral responsibilities too. Um, one is uh, always and foremost, you get up early, no matter what day or what month, you have to get up early. And before you go out, you have to look around to see if you identify danger. You just don't walk out there and, you know, and you have to Stop be around. Yeah, <laughs> and find that there's danger nearby, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, there's a lot to that uh, rites of passage. Um, they encourage you to harvest game because, you know, at an early age, if you get sick from seeing blood, then you're really in trouble <laughs> when you grow up because mm. you're not going to be able to eat. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons for encouraging you to harvest your first animal. Mm -hmm. You know, that, uh, that way they're making, um, they're ensuring that one of your assets to your character is to harvest, you know, sustenance for yourself and your family. Um, the other thing is, um, Wait, excuse me. The other thing too is um, not only get up early, but your condition to your environment. Um, where I'm from, we have summer as well as winters, and winters can be cruel and harsh, depending on circumstances, but normally, you know, when it's cold, it's cold. They encourage you to do things, condition yourself um, with uh, preparing to withstand the cold. In other words, you have to have the tolerance mm -hmm. for the cold, for, for you to survive in it. And they do that at an early age. Uh, when I was like six or six, I don't know, six, seven years old, I had to get up early in the morning and I was uh, encouraged to run about 100 or 200 feet from the house. In the back of the house, there's a little brush, uh, willow brush. Um, part of that uh, clump of brush, there's dead twigs in there. I had to pick those and run home with it and build fire without shoes, without socks. And that sounds harsh, but I'm glad I did that because I, as I was growing up, um, you know, every, every morning I'd run out and there was snow and a little ways out, a couple of hundred feet maybe, and run back and build fire and to warm up. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, some of some of those people who had done that, you know, it's stinging cold, without shoes, without socks, stinging cold. It's almost unbearable. But um, you know, some kids they stop and cry about it. They discourage that because they look at that as a way that they can already see your your character and how much um, tolerance it will have under pressure. Mm -hmm. And in the old days, life wasn't easy. So, you know, they, they really encouraged um, um, survival. They encouraged sustenance. They encouraged ability. These things are required for you to survive. Yeah. There, um, and then the other thing is um, when you're growing up, you're older now, not only, not only do they teach you not to step on or over 
uh, human wastes or animal wastes, but you graduate into other things. You graduate into um, your relationship with the opposite sex, the girls. Girls become childbearing anywhere from age 12 on up. And the very idea of women having the ability to uh, bear children is so sacred that they teach you to, to honor them. Um, you know, in that um, young ladies in puberty, you know, graduating to womanhood, they'd separate them from the community and they'd have them stay for, by themselves for about a month without them seeing anybody. Mother or grandmother would bring food and drinks to the girl in her hut and she's totally isolated. And um, as a young boy, you know, graduating from boyhood to manhood, there's a lot of um, inji about that. Inji is a word we use in Tanacross dialect that's equivalent to the downriver Hatlani. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot to it. There's a lot to it. Um, you can't even have a young girl, puberty girl, sit on your lap. You can't let them hang on to your arm. Um, you can't have them uh, do anything to your eyes or your ears because their spirit is so strong that uh, they can make you weak. They can make you very unlucky. And in the, in the world, in the old days, you can't be unlucky. You can't be weak. Um, you know, for the very purpose of sustenance, survival. And so there's a lot of great, uh, there's a great deal of uh, conditioning that's involved. Um, there's also the, um, the, the sharing that I told you about earlier, where not only do you share your food, but under the belief of Teju, which means you have compassion for the less fortunate. And at times you delivered wood to the old grandma, that, you know, a, a widow grandma or a, a lady that, you know, lost her husband and struggling to keep warm during the winter. Um, you attain a, a great deal of um, satisfaction um, by providing them with stuff they need because, you know, uh, women are, um, you know, if they have smaller children, um, they can't leave the children to go and haul wood and stuff like that, even though I've, I had seen uh, elderly grandmas haul wood on their own. It was pretty spectacular when I was a young boy to see, you know, old 80, 90 year old woman, you know, because mm -hmm. most everybody's gone and mm. a lot of people are at work. Um, so, you know, I was born in that area, in that era when working was, you know, a predominant force in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Any, uh, any more questions? Yeah, I hear you talking about crying, trying to create a sense of balance and always pushing out your awareness beyond what's 
what's just going on with you as an individual. And that's a definitely important life skill when you're relating to yourself and others. And I think about that as a as a man, you know, as a young parent. Um, at this stage in my life, you know, having gone through how I was raised and what I want for my child. And there's definitely lots of knowledge and experience to be passed down. Are there any helpful hints you might share perhaps with people who want to practice some of these things when they're back home in the village or also living here in town, for example? Yes, uh, there's, there's a few things that often are of concern to us today. One is uh, behavior of the youth. Um, it gets pretty uh, difficult to have a sedentary type of life where it, basically you're doing nothing and, you know, the lifestyle might be where you can jump in the car and drive a couple of miles and go to a movie and stuff. In the villages, we don't have that. Um, even though in my village, cars have been an everyday reality since 1942, long before I was born, because of the um, Alaska Highway being built during the Second World War. And um, that dramatically impacted the way of life. Um, not only was I subject to conditioning to, you know, the subject to the conditionings that would result in my sustaining my life, there was also some very bad impacts in my life. And, you know, because of the highway and because of the cars, uh, long before my time, the people had access to alcohol. And that had a dramatic impact on the lifestyle changes, if you will. Um, many of the th stuff that I talked about were people were ceasing to honor those practices way back then. I was one of them lucky ones who who had two sets of grandparents who were um, concerned enough to make sure that I experienced these things and, you know, so that I can have the sense of not only direction, but the sense of purpose um, to live a good life. And, you know, like everybody else, I had my bouts with alcoholism and drug abuse in my early years, in my early life. Um, one of the things I wanted to really emphasize, the importance of to the youth, mostly to the young men and the young girls, is the sense of self-worth. Um, you know, to me, um, the sense of self-worth is the fact that where you care for yourself enough to try to do all you can to sustain yourself. And there's many challenges, as they know. Uh, one is fitting into the crowd. Another is fitting into a family unit. Sometimes your older brother, your older sister simply um, cannot deal with you because of the age difference. And, you know, exchanges of uh, words would sometimes be harsh, but you have to remember that um, the elders, they teach you life sustenance skills for one purpose, to live your life till the great creator decides to bring you home. And what it, when, whenever that may be, do all you can to 
live a great life, healthy life, and a productive life. And, and um, the message I'd like to give to the youth today is that, you know, nobody really can answer the reasons that there is human life. I mean, I've studied that by reading um, such things as um, the book called Confessions by uh, Leo Tolstoy. It's a very um, poignant book. It talks about how he became uh, uh, he became uh, saddened and and you know almost had uh, gotten a a sense of worthlessness and a you know just plain senselessness to life. That was pretty. It was a very heavy duty feeling that he talked about and you know I can see even in my life I went through that as well what really kept me from self-destruction was my early uh, my my early uh, impact my early life impact by my parents my grandparents the elders in the village as to the importance and the value of life and uh, that I needed to be self-preserving. Uh, self so, you know, it was, I had the depression for like five years, six years. It was really a terrible period in my life. I was young, I was like, 19 years old. And I had it for until I was about 23, 24 years old. And it's not the best thing to go through, but I've learned to deal with it where I reached out and asked for help everywhere and anywhere. So the preservation that I was talking about in our lifestyle is the elders, they want you to be busy. Um, you can't have periods of time, long periods of time, where you're um, you're not doing anything. You have to, you know, um, get up early. You have to prepare yourself with uh, eating and getting ready for the day's task. And there's many things you have to do. You have to haul wood, you have to check your traps, you got to go hunting, you got to, you know, in this day and age, you don't do that much. Um, but just because we don't do that anymore doesn't mean that you can sit aimlessly and without doing anything. You know, you can do things like read, you can research, um, you can visit with uh, elders and you know ask them um, questions about how things were done. There's a lot of interesting things. Um, one of the things that I, in my early life, that I've learned was to speak my language and to learn the song, sing, the, the songs, and the uh, during potlatches. And I learned to not only sing the dancing songs, but also learn to, to sing the grieving songs. This is a responsibility of all young men, but sometimes it's very difficult at home to basically be the only person that sings these things. Nobody will sing it unless you sing it, you know. It used to have been a whole group of men sing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we want our young people to carry these traditions and to feel like they have a place and not only to 
continue these processes because they've been done before, but knowing how it helps you be a part of your your family and your community. Singing is definitely something very meaningful in my life. And some of the the people who I respect highly are the singers and the ones who compose songs for memorial potlatches especially. And there's a long tradition of of taking those songs and, and sharing them and and Sometimes I think they might even change over time from like a really sad song to like a one that you would share in a public setting. Mm -hmm. Like I know a couple that uh, have transformed in that way. And there's uh, there's a lot to learn too about the history of how those songs were created and also the chance to compose new songs. I really get excited when some of the young people in my village where I'm from in the surrounding area, Ruby and Galena and Tanana, when they get really into dancing and singing and that's such a, a good way to connect with our young people too because they like to be active and lots of energy yep. <laughs> and keep us going yeah. and we need our young people to share that energy and to help us stay um, focused on how to bring them up and take care of them and that gives me purpose in my life as as a father and you know if we're blessed with more and more children and got my nephews and my nieces to think about and those are um, maybe how my uncles and aunties and grandparents felt too with with us as we were growing we need our young people to to be there alongside with us and they're always watching us so it does matter how we spend our time and how we interact with each other and uh, one of the things I've heard you mention too is how it's a really important skill to learn how to listen and this is something that I've grown in recently as, a, as a, someone who sat through school and college and lots of time sitting but always active up here and thinking about what was next, what's my next thing in the calendar, or thinking about what I would say in response to that person, what they're sharing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's difficult to just sit there and let it sink in and, and let your, take in what's being said. Have you ever gotten any, uh, have you ever had those types of conversations with people on how to be effective with that? Lots. I've had um, many mentors. Um, oftentimes I try to um, share with uh, people that my father and my mother weren't the only ones that mentored me. Not only them, I had my grandfather and my grandmother on my mom's side, as well as my mom's relatives and even some of my dad's relatives. For some reason, historically, the Nalteen leaders don't uh, mentor the Tikagyu men like me. That's the responsibility of the Tikagyu leaders and elders. Mm -hmm. um, but in my experience, uh, as I was growing up, my grandparents would or my mother even would say, Jane Deck, which means listen. Just simple thing like that. And, uh, you know, it, it, is, uh, it is a skill to listen. Because when um, my dad gets into this, uh, <laughs> this long, monotonous description of events or subject matter, you know, that's the time when your eyes start to wander <laughs> you know, you're not listening. But you have to listen. You have to try to pick um, the value of that um, mentoring that they're uh, providing you. And oftentimes uh, when we were kids, um, 
Um, you know, what helped a great deal was the BIA teacher, and I still remember her. God bless her soul. If she's, if she's alive, I'd send my best regards. Mrs. Graves was her name, Ruby Graves. At an early age, she invited the elders to come in and share culture at the school. And I was like seven years old when she did that. And uh, I was ashamed to dance. They told us to dance and most uh, the kids, as kids, we didn't dance that time. We were too shy. But um, Mrs. Uh, Graves, she had food prepared for the, for the people. We ate and we, you know, we did our prayers. We ate and then they started to share stories and then singing and dancing. And I never really started dancing until I was 14, 15 years old. Because, uh, you know, in the new, in the new day, uh, it was, I mean, you know, that's part of my life that I didn't like is that there was a period in my life when people didn't want to speak our language or they didn't want to look native. Um, they cut their hair short and they wore butch wax, you know, to keep their hair in, in order and stuff like that. Those were the days I was growing up and I had a lot of confusion. And, uh, but the bottom line was you know, the elders, they keep saying, listen, you know, and when they talk to us, they say it in a good way, like, I say this because your dad is my brother and I have a responsibility to you. So, you know, that, that removes that um, anger that builds up in you, mm -hmm. that it removes that. And it makes you feel akin to the speaker. So, I mean, there's a lot of those skills that I try to use today. Um, one of the things that I try to do is to appreciate the youth and show that I appreciate them and not shoo them away or not criticize them. Um, you know, a few times I, I lost uh, patience with my own grandchildren because they don't listen. You know, they're just growing up, you know. So there's a lot of value to, um, you know, the art of listening. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in our routines that a lot of us have with public schooling or with finding employment, in a work setting, you're sitting a lot and you're thinking about how to get through your schedule. That's sort of my experience. And mm -hmm. what I really enjoy is uh, having conversations and learning. And I find that it really helps too if I'm doing something with my hands. Um, a lot of uh, people, my wife likes to uh, you know, work on things, whether it's sewing or beadwork or crafting and you can uh, for me some of the best conversations I have happen to be in the car I don't know because I'm just yeah. focused on the road <laughs> and maybe I don't have to look at them or feel like too too confronted yeah and there's everyone has their own thing I hope that people can find the thing that works for them that will help them connect with others and like you say learn from others without feeling that defensive come in because uh, people with experience I think that they share things because they care because they hope that that young person can avoid the hardship that they that uh, you know, that person might have gone through and they you know I want that for my next generation too to learn from my experience and to have that benefit to to not have to go through those hard things and I think you can always learn by what someone is saying and also by what they're not saying. And, you know, they're not criticizing 
in the same way. It's uh, it's definitely um, something that you try to tailor for who you're speaking with, I think. That's a very mm -hmm. important skill. You mentioned some different stages in your life from being uh, a young boy to a uh, young man. What else might you share about stages or milestones that you're aware of or you might have experienced in your life? <laughs> At a young age, I was heavily impacted by the liberal movement of the 60s. And uh, it created a great deal of confusion for me because I really bought into that idealism back then, the free love and, you know, freedom of speech and freedom of choice and stuff, but little did they teach about the responsibility that comes because of your choice. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was, I was um, you know, bumbling around basically in my early years trying to find out who I am. Um, I was in my early life, I kind of felt like um, I shouldn't be native, you know, because of the lifestyle that uh, that's predominant and, and that um, I don't fit in. And, you know, I feel, uh, I, I felt different because I strong with, I mean, I spoke with a strong native accent. Um, it's a village based, that's the way we talked every day in the village and so on. You know, like even the word village, when I was growing up, we used to say village. You know, <laughs> so, and I had uh, a really strong sense of uh, um, you know not owning up. Uh, I didn't have a very high level of self worth, and that's why I'm kind of focusing on self worth. Um, you know, you you accept yourself with everything about you. If you speak your language, fine, that's good, that's great. If you don't, it's still okay. There are other ways, you know, because of the lifestyle we have today is that um, this is not a village, this is Fairbanks, you know, and you have, you know, modern stuff. And, and you know, there are things that, uh, we, ex we live in today that my parents didn't live with in the past, but because of their lifestyle at that at that time dictated the way they developed their character. Today, if, uh, you know, like hunting, for example, is not a necessity really. I mean, every year we have to go out and get get a, a harvest moose. But if you didn't, you survived the best way you can. And that is, you know, harvesting other game animals. But if you don't, if you're not, if you don't have that available, then you do the best thing that is to go to the shopping mall and go get your food. You know, you have to be equally comfortable with either or in today's world because you know like ex as an example um, in the upper town now we have you know moose population that's very low mm -hmm. and every year it seems like it's a struggle just to harvest and not only trying to harvest them but you have competition, you know, people who first time hunters and I don't have anything against them. It's just, it makes my harvesting harder, but yeah. there's other 
alternatives that I can do, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you need to know how to adapt to your situation. And yes. It is a, a mixed economy that we're seeing today. And, you know, it's almost a luxury for someone with a full-time job to be able to have that time to go fishing or go look around during the, the open season. And um, I think there's ways we can work towards a better balance with our organizations mm -hmm. and with our laws in place that we can uh, advocate for a way to m make it work better for us and have more uh, participation and, and equity. So that's a, a good point that you raise. Maybe some people in Fairbanks would find it convenient to go hunt up the highway villages and thinking about their family and all their there are things that are important to them, but not realizing that there's a, a, a greater local need as well. Mm -hmm. So we're finding that there's these changes going on, and and how do we how do we come to an understanding around those things? So there's lots to lots to learn there and discuss, perhaps in future episodes. I'm I'm just so grateful that you chose to take the time to be here with us today and to share in this space at Morris Thompson Center for that's intended to be a, a public uh, forum for for learning together and for promoting our understanding of our traditional ways of life and how we can use those today even is there anything that you'd like to add that you haven't had a chance to share yet before we start to close out our time this evening um. I just want to emphasize to the youth that um, they may feel they don't fit in or they're in the wrong period in the long span called life. But there is a purpose. There is a reason we're here and we're all allotted our time. and. You know, life is sacred, and you know the the native lifestyle is to first and foremost impress upon you the value of life and the need for life. Mm -hmm. We we're taught that uh, we don't know where life came from. But we live today, and our res personal responsibility is to sustain that life until the time comes when you know you leave uh, Mother Earth, and you should not try to precipitate that. Um, in our language, they say "in chi." You don't want to wish. The end of life on yourself or anyone. Mm -hmm. So, I just want to impress on the youth today that um, all of us we experienced uh, different lifestyles. Um, you know, I was reading about a farmer family in Oklahoma, and that was during the Dust Bowl days. And they had to move because they just couldn't raise crops anymore. Mm -hmm. And they moved to California and, you know, for a while they were picking fruits. But then the family had to change their mode of lifestyle so that, you know, they'd have the comfort level that they once had. and. It was, um, you know, I was thankful that they shared that story because, uh, you know, it's happening to us as well up here where, like I say, at home, I don't go hunting. And, you know, I comply with state rules, regulations where we have uh, hunting season every, every year, September. Sometimes for 10 days, sometimes for two weeks. 
If you get anything, good luck to you. If you don't, then you don't. Some families and some friends share with their harvest with you, so you didn't really go without meat. But um, there's this spiritual connection to the consumption of moose meat, moose meat and caribou meat and, you know, fish and game that I really cannot explain right now. But, um, you know, because I don't feel 100% um, well. I don't feel 100% my self-worth if I don't consume local um, food. And I don't know whether there's any scientific reasoning for that other than the fact that culturally that was my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I'm just uh, at that, uh, I am, unfortunately I am of that um, generation where I am kind of, uh, kind of forced to live without. And personally, um, I can live with it, but not everybody can. I've always believed in adaptation and learning new lifestyles and learning new things, new ideas, but not everybody's adept at that. And, you know, just sharing with you, you know, the, the stuff that you share with me, I appreciate that because it's from a different perspective and I see, you know, that it has, you know, a great deal of sense and validity that, uh, you know, it validates uh, a viewpoint that I've never seen, you know, this stuff. So it's, it's interesting. Um, I'd like to say thank you for uh, allowing me to share time with you here. And, um, you know, the, the stuff that I um, shared, I know I wasn't too compact because I'm jumping from here to there, you know, this stuff. Uh, you know, there's a lot more to traditional rearing, the uh, traditional teachings. A certain point in your life, um, they teach you, like um, when I was younger boy, they taught me the, the, um, value of silence and the reason for that is in them early days there used to have been people who kidnapped children so you got to be aware of your surroundings and you know sometimes if you don't know how to handle silence it drives you crazy so, I mean, this is a few times that my grandfather took me out in the woods and we did nothing but sit and listen to the surroundings. And as a little boy, I kind of, I was bored, you know, within a relatively short period of time, but we sat there and did nothing all day. Not only one day, but several times. And then that's when I learned that sometimes you need to sit down and really listen to your surroundings. The, the sound of silence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're almost a form of meditation. Yeah. It could be. It's traditional. Um, the, you know, the, the, I don't want to talk about other native lifestyles because I don't know. The Athabascan li lifestyle was, we didn't have music, we, you know, we didn't have nothing other than, you know, living out there in a cold winter in a little shelter and, you know, you, the short daylight doesn't allow you to do much. So you have to learn how to maintain your mental health. Mm -hmm. And that was very crucial that you learned that in early age. Mm -hmm. So I am thankful I didn't need it because today I can listen to music and 
watch movies or TV, <laughs> or either I can visit a friend that lives a hundred miles away. You know, in the old days, visiting somebody ten miles away was a was a day's effort. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. So I just want to thank you for allowing me to spend some time with you. We're so grateful that you chose to be here. Tene cho na basi. I hope that uh, we have a chance to share time together again in the future. And um, I'd like to mention to our viewers, thank you for tuning in and listening to this session. Be on the lookout at the Morse Thompson Center, what will be available in the future through social media. And I want to thank everyone again. Be safe out there. Take care. This is your host, Dewey Katlia Hoffman, signing off. Have a good evening, everybody.